Episode 7, Bitcoin White Paper, Part 4, Proof of Work, recorded 8th of November, 2019. This is Bitcoin Basics Podcast with your host Ferris, that's me, and Gordon from Coin Compass. We're Bitcoin advisors and educators supporting business and individual investors to safely buy, manage, and control their private keys, Bitcoins. Visit coincompass.com for more information. This podcast is strictly educational and is not intended to be financial or investment advice. Full disclaimer in the show notes and at the end of this episode. Now, how is a transaction confirmed? And this is where Gordon's actually going to explain what Bitcoin mining is. So we said anyone can join the Bitcoin network. So how do you join the Bitcoin network? Why would you join the Bitcoin network? And what is mining? Transactions are processed by miners. And one of the ways that they are processed is something called proof of work. And proof of work is essentially computers solving a complicated mathematical problem that will take on average around about 10 minutes. And it's not exactly 10 minutes. You can actually look at the statistics. It's anywhere between seven minutes and 13 minutes, but it's around about 10 minutes and that gets adjusted every two weeks in Bitcoin. But those transactions are processed by computers. Back in the day when I actually first started Bitcoin, I could do that on my laptop. So using a normal CPU, I could process transactions. But nowadays the Bitcoin network has become so popular that you can't even do it with large computers. You need specialized software and hardware, and that's specifically made for Bitcoin. And it's only made for one process, and that's this proof of work. You can't use it for anything else. So even if you have a Bitcoin miner, you can't use it as a normal operating system or anything else. What that does is those Bitcoin miners, so they're running this specialized hardware and software to do these transactions, you might think, well, why do they do that? They're just wasting power and they bought this equipment. You know, what's the reward? They actually do this for two reasons. And this is why Bitcoin and the blockchain has solved this by creating incentive for these miners. And there's two ways that they get incentive. One is they actually get fees. So every time you send a Bitcoin, you actually attach a little bit extra, depending on how busy or quiet the Bitcoin network is. And those miners will actually pick up those fees. Secondly, the first miner, and it could be an individual or it could be a company that runs runs several miners, and that could be a group of 100 or 200 people. The first, and we call them pools or mining pools. So, for example, the biggest mining pool has around about 100 or 150 people. And each one of those people might be running up to 10 or 20 miners. The first individual or pool that solves this mathematical problem first is given a mining reward. Bitcoin first started in 2008, 2009, and the mining reward for solving this mathematical problem in 10 minutes was 50 Bitcoin. So every 10 minutes, the Bitcoin network would give miners who solved the problem first 50 Bitcoins. Around about every four years, that starts to halve. So in 2008, it was 50. We then went on to about 2012, and that was 25. Then we went down to currently what it is now is 12.5. So every 10 minutes, so every time a new block starts, the individual or mining pool that solves that mathematical problem first is nowadays in 2018 given 12.5 Bitcoins as an incentive for providing the security for processing the transactions on the Bitcoin network. Thanks, Gordon. Now, I think a good example for me that helped me understand how mining works, and it might not be an accurate one as far as the technology goes, um, but just, yeah, it helped me a lot, is when you think of um, the film The Imitation Game, um, or anyone familiar with the Enigma machines that was used in World War II. So if you've seen The Imitation Game, um, Alan Turing basically designs a computer to break the German codes that they're sending from each other. So he is reverse engineering a code. And to do that, he puts his huge computer to work to reverse engineer the code so he can read the messages. So I kind of see Bitcoin and the blockchain as working the same way. I send you 10 Bitcoin. That's actually part of a mathematical formula. 
Um, for it to be confirmed, a computer has to solve the formula. And when a formula is solved, that's one confirmation. So if you started in Bitcoin early, because there was not much competition as far as computers go, you could get a laptop and you could put your laptop to work and solve the code. Now, obviously, you're buying a laptop and you're using a lot of electricity. So as a reward, you get paid in Bitcoin. So I send someone some Bitcoin as a transaction fee. That's just like um, a bank fee. But also every 10 minutes, new Bitcoin are released. And you've got to discover where are those Bitcoin. The way you discover those Bitcoin is by your computer cracking the code. Now, how's that go from my non-tech explanation cords? At the end of the day, there's no incentive for someone to become a Bitcoin miner if they don't receive this mining reward. Um, so that's the incentive. It is a little bit different from processing the transactions. So that mathematical algorithm, the problem that they have to solve, it doesn't really matter what that mathematical algorithm is. It happens just to be a very long string of numbers with zeros and the computers are actually trying to solve how many zeros are in that long string of numbers. It doesn't matter what that is. The proof of work, those computers spending electricity, those computers spending energy, spending money is what is important. So that's the thing that secures the Bitcoin network. And it's an oversimplistic analogy, but I like to use the analogy of, of mining for gold. When you first start mining for gold, when they first discovered gold, it might have been in the ground, might have been even laying there. You don't need any tools. As eventually mining companies and gold rushes happen, you maybe invest in a shovel and you do a little bit of work. But as more and more gold gets found, you need to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. You need to put more of your money into buying better equipment. And now eventually in the current day, you have, you know, mines that are kilometers and kilometers beneath the surface and you've got large companies doing it. An individual prospector can't really mine for gold. Similar to Bitcoin, you need to have a significant financial investment, just like if in 2018 you wanted to find some gold. The same in Bitcoin, you would need to invest quite a lot of money and even an individual with a couple of Bitcoin miners is unlikely to find any Bitcoin by themselves. So nowadays you join a mining pool and if that mining pool happens to solve the algorithm first, then that mining pool gets the 12.5 Bitcoin reward. But of course, if you've got 200 people in the mining pool, you're getting a fraction of that. All right, so let's just revisit that last sentence before we move on to the next one. I know this was a bit of a long-winded one, but this really was the crux of how everything works. So rereading that last sentence, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. So that part we've explained quite well. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof-of-work. So that is those 10-minute blocks that we were talking about. Transactions are combined together into a block of, say, 10 minutes. Those transactions then have to go through that proof of work. So that's the computers working to prove that formula. So rereading the sentence here, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. So another example is, say, um, if you have a 20-story building, the first floor is not going anywhere. The only way you're going to get rid of the first floor is to knock down the 19 stories above it. So this is where a blockchain is. It is a chain of these confirmed blocks. The longer it goes, the more secure it is. And as Gordon mentioned earlier, Bitcoin has been running now for almost 10 years. That block of chains is so secure that it's now reached a point where it is unhackable. If NASA or all the other agencies wanted to get together, they're competing with thousands of computers around the world that are protecting this chain. So that's where we are in Bitcoin today. It is an unhackable network that is completely decentralized. And we've mentioned the word decentralized, and that's something that we do want to explain again later. Now, before we move on to the next sentence in the uh, abstract here, Gordon, is there anything else you think we need to add? What preempting one of the common questions is, well, as, as you said, why can't someone like the NSA or a government agency or even a state actor get together some of these supercomputers and just put them on the network so that they can change transactions, they can perhaps really reverse transactions. Well, that's why the ingenious of, of Bitcoin and particular blockchain is that it is extremely expensive to do so. So if you think of now in 2018, if a state actor or someone with a lot of computer power wanted to change or reverse transactions, 
they would have to have more than 51% of the actual processing, or we call in Bitcoin the hashing power of the network. When we're processing these transactions every 10 minutes, those transactions are being processed by the Bitcoin miners. So your question might be, well, why can't the US government, why can't X government or X company just have their own miners and they compete on the Bitcoin network? They change transactions, they censor transactions, they reverse transactions. Well, they could, but what they would have to have is more than 51% of the processing power, hashing power of the Bitcoin network. If you go to a website like Crypto51, it actually tells you how much money it would take at current market price of changing or reversing the Bitcoin network of the transactions. At the moment, that would cost around about $700,000 to change it for one hour. And you might be thinking, well, that's pretty cheap. They've got billions of dollars. That is one of the things about proof of work is that what they would be doing is that, yes, they would be able to spend $700,000 and they would be able to reverse Bitcoin transactions for one hour. Bitcoin's been around since 2008, really 2009. So what they would have to do is not only change it for one hour, which would cost $700,000, they would need to change it since the beginning of Bitcoin, what we call block zero, the Genesis block, since 2008. If a government wanted to change it right now, they would need to spend trillions more than that to change it back to block zero in 2008. But if they then just stopped, then the miners would take over and then ignore all those transactions. So they would actually need to change it since 2008 until now, but also from now until the future. So economically, it is just not feasible to do so. Thanks, Gordon. Now, that actually leads us into our next sentence. But um, just from my um, layman's point of view, tell me if this is a good example. So let's say that the Bitcoin blockchain is a really, really tall building. So when you say if a government want to change transactions, what we're really talking about is we've heard the term, well, governments will shut Bitcoin down. So if you have a thousand story building and you want to knock it down completely, with Bitcoin, you have to do it floor by floor. You knock out the thousandth floor, the 999th, 998th. So what you're saying is to invalidate the transactions, to knock out the thousandth floor, it costs you $700,000. For Yeah, that removes one hour. But we have to go back all the way to 2008. And as soon as... But at the same time that someone is trying to knock down Bitcoin, we've got the network, which is all the miners that are building it up. Now, we've got the network has a 10-year advantage. So governments would have to basically put so much money into knocking down Bitcoin. And if they want to, they'd have to explain to people why are they doing it, why are they threatened by it. So that's what when we say Bitcoin has actually come to a point now where the blockchain itself is so secure, it cannot go anywhere. It would be, you know, it's like you look at the pyramids now. Imagine if people kept building the pyramids and you're trying to knock it down. You couldn't get back. You couldn't do that. There's just not enough power um, competing with the power that's already there. Does that explain it well? Yeah. And that, again, that is what proof of work is. So it would be virtually impossible for anyone to be able to do that. So this is where in the abstract, we read the sentence, the longest chain not only serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed, but proof that it came from the largest pool of CPU power. So as Gordon mentioned, the 51%. So think of a referendum or an election. If you want a referendum to get through, all you need is above 50%, so 51% of the votes, and something gets passed. It's the same thing with the blockchain. 51% of the network is what validates a transaction. So the longest chain serves as proof of the sequence of events witness, which means we've seen this transaction, we have confirmed it. But proof it came from the largest pool of computing power. So where Gordon mentioned the 51%, so think of an election. If you want to vote through a referendum, all you need is a 51% of the people that showed up to vote for it, and it's passed. The same thing works on the Bitcoin blockchain. Once you have 51% of the people voting by their computer power, that forms the longest chain, and that confirmation goes through. So you can actually see that the Bitcoin network, which has been around for 10 years, is people voluntarily joining the network and voting together to pass these things through. So even though it is um, 
independent. It is actually quite, it is autonomous. It's very cooperative. People have a financial incentive to keep Bitcoin going. I, I like your analogy of the building and the building is 10 years old. So it's a thousand story building and that building is really secure. It's got an, an enormous foundation. It's built with steel and it is secure. Someone who wanted to attack what we call a 51% attack would actually have to start knocking down those floors from the top while Bitcoiners were trying to build up at the same time. One of the reasons why people complain about Bitcoin is that it wastes so much energy and it wastes so much power. And that's actually important because that energy, the proof of work, actually secures the network. So if we go back to our tower again, and this may be using the analogy a bit too much, someone could actually build the same tower out of clay, but that's easy to knock down. This tower of Bitcoin has been built over 10 years. It's strong as secure. If you don't use that proof of work, which in Bitcoin is basically using money to buy mining equipment and paying for electricity, then what you've done instead is build a blockchain like a thousand story building, but out of paper or out of clay. You haven't really put that energy into a proof of work. So with that, this actually, we've explained the next sentence that comes along in the abstract. As long as a majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain and outpace attackers. So the analogy we've just given really explains this. The majority of computers on the network, which is 51%, that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest chain. So they're working together to keep the chain going. So if 51% of the computers on the network go, you know what, we want to start attacking the building and bringing it down, then yes, that can happen. But this isn't an external power. This is people on the network. But there's no incentive for them to do that. They're getting paid in Bitcoin, transaction fees, and Bitcoin mining. Thanks for watching or listening. Please visit coincompass.com slash free to register to our socials and discover other free content. Subscribing, liking, and following helps this content remain ad-free. Until next time. Disclaimer. Any content provided by Coin Compass or the Bitcoin Basics podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and is not investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. A qualified professional should be consulted before making any financial decisions. Coin Compass or the Bitcoin Basics podcast will at times recommend certain products, services, and technologies But these are opinions based upon our own or podcast guests' experience and not endorsements. We take no liability for out-of-date or inaccurate information, software bugs, manufacturing errors, technology misuse, or issues involving third parties. Visit coincompass.com for more information and please contact us.